Cass. Yeah. Hey, Cass, this is Jonathan Doherty. Hey, Jonathan. Just so you know, the access code and the dial-in information that was in the calendar invitation is different from the information you sent out today. So. Yeah, I sent a follow-up note about that. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Okay. No worries. No worries. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Cass Hardy, and mm -hmm. I serve on the National Park Service Scaling Up Team, which is a work group that's focused on large landscape conservation. There's a number of our team members on the call today and on the webinar. Um, so thanks so much on behalf of our team for joining us webinar. Um, we are a monthly webinar series for the last year or so now, where we focus in on a different topic each month. Um, and specifically on topics that are tools that enable us to work beyond park boundaries. So um, with us today, we have Julia King and Scott Strickland um, from St. Mary's College of Maryland, and they have a topic focused on indigenous cultural landscapes. Um, a little housekeeping before we get started. If you can put your phone on mute, that would help us a lot with the presentation. Um, we are recording the webinar, so if you know folks who uh, were unable to join us today, they'll be able to access that recording on our external pages with the Practitioners Network for Large Landscape Conservation, or if you're a Park Service employee, you can access that on the Scaling Up Toolkit. We'll put both of those links in the chat box. Um, and throughout the presentation, if you do have questions or comments, feel free to use that chat box. We'll monitor that and come back to those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, presentation should be about 20 minutes long or so, and then we'll leave the last five to ten minutes for any outstanding questions that folks may have. Um, with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Julia King um, to kick us off with the presentation. Hi. Hi. My name is Julie King, and I'm here with Scott Strickland. Um, both of us are archaeologists with St. Mary's College of Maryland. It's a four-year public liberal arts college located in St. Mary City, Maryland. Uh, St. Mary City is the southern edge of Piscataway homeland, and in 1634 it became the first colonial capital of Maryland. I'm a professor of anthropology at St. Mary's, and Scott is our senior project archaeologist and GIS specialist. We are here today to talk with you about our experiences mapping the indigenous cultural landscape, which we've been doing as part of the National Park Service's Captain John Smith Chesapeake National Historic Trail. Our work is being done for MPS's Chesapeake Bay Office, which aims to help citizens learn about and enjoy the Chesapeake Bay. And for the Chesapeake Conservancy, which is a nonprofit organization based in Annapolis that uses a number of strategies to conserve landscapes associated with the Chesapeake Bay watershed, restore the region's natural resources, and connect people to this amazing place. The Chesapeake Conservancy has long been a partner with MPS on the Captain John Smith Trail. Our plan for this webinar is to show you how we, how St. Mary's uh, College, in collaboration with NPS and the Chesapeake Conservancy, have approached the effort to model the indigenous cultural landscape, or ICLs, as we've come to refer to them in shorthand, so that you might take some of these ideas, methods, and techniques that we've been using and apply them to your own efforts in land and cultural conservation. We hope to make the point today that natural and cultural history and therefore natural and cultural landscapes are inextricably entwined, intertwined, and to know and understand one requires knowing and understanding the other. We also hope to suggest that landscapes that might at first seem invisible to the viewer, such as an indigenous or Native American landscape, are in fact readily observable with proper framing, and that the people who in 1607 and 1608 greeted, greeted Captain John Smith are, as Piscataway Kanoi Tribal Chair Francis Gray has suggested, are still here. And finally, we also hope you will have questions and comments at the end, which will help us improve our work in the Chesapeake um, watershed. Now, the indigenous cultural landscape is a, com is a concept that has become integral, integral to the Captain John Smith Chesapeake National Historic Trail Comprehensive Management Plan. NPS American Indian Program Manager Deanna Beecham describes ICLs as, quote, holistic homelands, 
composed of units of large and natural land large and natural enough to accurately reflect the cultural life ways of the communities that lived within them. In other words, ICLs are not just lists of discrete archaeological sites here and there, but sites, meaningful places, and natural resources that are integrated into a larger whole, a larger landscape. And importantly, the Smith Trail Comprehensive Plan notes that the ICL concept, quote, recognizes that indigenous communities still exist and that respecting them and their cultures is a valid and central goal of any land or water conservation effort. The comprehensive plan notes that descendant uh, indigenous groups should participate in selecting and prioritizing culturally significant indigenous landscapes. For these communities, the ICL concept can be used as a tool for leveling the playing field in land and water conservation. So it really can pay great dividends. For more information on the ICL effort, including reports, white papers, and even a short video discussing the concept, um, be sure to visit the NPS's Chesapeake Bay website and click on the link about the indigenous cultural landscape. Now our goal today is to show you how we operationalized the ICL concept on the ground, so to speak. First working with the Piscataway people of Maryland to identify the Nanjamoy and Matawoman ICLs along the Potomac River, and now with the Rappahannock tribe of Virginia to identify the Rappahannock ICL. The Potomac and Rappahannock, if you're not from the area, are important tributaries of the Chesapeake Bay. I'll talk a couple more minutes about pulling together a broad and diverse group of stakeholders, beginning with tribes. And then Scott will talk about how he pulled together a vast array of information in a geographic information system, or GIS. Now, the first step is to identify any and all tribal stakeholders for your project area. In our case, the Piscataway Kanoi Tribe of Maryland and the Piscataway Indian Nation, both state recognized tribes, uh, continue in their homeland. And Scott and I have been working with the two groups for a number of years. That, that made our work actually really a lot easier. Relationship building is critical in these cases. And we had an ongoing relationship with the Piscataway that went back several years. For the Nanjamoy Matawoman ICL, we asked the tribes to tell us who would represent their interest in the project. And by the way, I should note that if there are federal tribes associated with your landscape, um, as you know, they have a special relationship with the U.S. government, and we recommend that you um, read about tribal consultation at the link that's shown in this slide. Now, we had previously developed a scope of work that made the assumption that the best way to map the landscape was to get out into it. And off we went with project staff and Piscataway representatives. We brought along video cameras and audio recorders. We made every effort to use roads that had probably developed out of native and colonial paths. And by the way, in our case, project staff included an ethnographer, and that was Dr. Virginia Busby of Hillside Consulting to help us collect a lot of this information. Uh, Non-tribal stakeholders, land planners, land managers, land conservationists, historic preservationists, and so on, are also critical participants in this process. We cast our net wide for these stakeholders, and we really enjoyed input from some 25 individuals representing 11 agencies and organizations in the case of the Nanjamoy Matter Woman ICL. We printed off large size maps, as you can see here, and we brought pens and post-its, very low tech, um, for participants to mark up. Um, we took notes, and where necessary, we followed up uh, later, either via email, phone calls, or actually in the field. These meetings were all day, time-consuming affairs, um, when meeting with the tribes especially, so we made sure to provide lunch and an honorarium for people's participation. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to uh, Scott Strickland. Hello, I'm Scott Strickland. I'm going to pick up uh, where Julie left off and discuss some of the mapping details. <clears throat> the National Park Service has developed criteria for the features generally found to constitute an ICL. Uh, these criteria include good agricultural soil, fresh water, transportation tributaries, water landing places, proximity to marshes, brushy areas, primary or mixed deciduous forest, 
uplands that support hunting, proximity to known American Indian communities, protection from wind, high terrace landforms, areas associated with living communities and families, <coughs> any areas associated with indigenous use in the past, burial sites in spiritually significant areas, and places known through historical documentation. <coughs> Some of these criteria are based on environmental assumptions conducive to settlement activity by native people, such as access to fresh water, food resources, agricultural land, and well-drained soils, <coughs> all of which are necessary to sustain a population. These criteria are data that, in this era of digital technology, can be collected, inferred, mapped, and interpreted. <coughs> data acquisition of GIS layers used to recreate these criteria were collated from a variety of sources, such as soil data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture <coughs> and wetland data from the National Wetland Inventory Survey as well as topographic data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and land use data from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. The data itself does not come into a form immediately ready with documenting ICL criteria. Soil data, for example, comes down to an expansive data set with information related to soil physical properties, uh, agricultural yield estimates, land use suitability and other data that might not be relevant to an ICL study. Of particular interest for our purposes uh, were the yield estimates of corn, the staple crop in native agriculture. Yields were estimated in bushels per acre and mapped onto the project area. In the case of Nanjimoy and Manawagan Creek watersheds, these two watersheds formed part of the ancient and modern Piscataway homelands. In a similar vein, <coughs> Wetland data was parsed to separate marshlands, which are associated with other food resources, such as waterfowl, fish, and plant sources of food. <coughs> Using previous models of human settlement in the Potomac Valley, our study, <coughs> our, or our study area, and in incorporating current archaeological site data, we were able to examine correlations of recorded sites with the different environmental variable, which such as which soils have a strong site correlation, which elevations are most uh, sites most commonly found on, and what proximity range is considered advantageous for different resource exploitation. By the way, <coughs> in this map, you will note what seems to be a paucity of archaeological sites in the study area. This absence, however, more likely reflects a lack of archaeological survey in this region and not an absence of sites. Where sites are concentrated, <coughs> such as along Mattawoman Creek, it's worth noting that a major naval installation is located here, and the land managers have been very active in identifying archaeological sites aboard the facility. Given the context of the Captain John Smith Chesapeake National Historic Trail, <coughs> and the trail's interest in the life of the people here immediately prior to European colonization, uh, sites dating to the late woodland and contact periods were of most interest. <coughs> the late woodland period is an archaeological category, referring to native occupation from about 900 to 1600 CE. The contact period is, as its name suggests, the period of initial colonization or invasion, depending on your perspective, uh, principally during the 17th century. <coughs> Finding the types of landscapes native populations inhabited during these two periods was a core tenet for mapping the ICL. Connecting those landscapes to 18th and 19th centuries, as well as modern Piscataway landscapes, was the second core tenet. GIS, or Geographic Information Systems, allows us to take these multiple data themes and resource layers <coughs> to measure and visualize where they overlap. The more different data themes that overlap the higher probability of representing the ICL. <coughs> it also serves as a check to the ICL core criteria itself, as, a, as in are there environmental criteria that don't exhibit the strong correlation with the distribution of archaeological sites. Uh, what we have found is that native settlements can be expected with relative confidence on slightly elevated floodplains <coughs> that consist of well-drained, generally sandy soils 
in close proximity to large or wide water bodies and marshes. Even more simply put, settlements are typically located in dry, flat areas where you can both build and grow crops with easy access to transportation corridors by means of water. <clears throat> As a public, recreational, and educational resource, the John Smith Trail is enhanced by user experiences that <clears throat> kind of evoke a sense of the native landscape. While sometimes challenging to define, <clears throat> driving tours with the Piscataway and NPS staff shaped notions of the landscape they considered to be evocative. We learned that for the Piscataway, evocative landscapes mean <clears throat> land along uh, waterways adjacent to marshes with forest cover and views that are unobstructed by modern features. <clears throat> to map evocative landscapes, Land use and land classification data was used to identify forested land versus agricultural or developed land, where large contiguous tracts of forest land were identified along the waterways, and within close proximity to the marshes, those areas were categorized as evocative of the ICL. <clears throat> this exercise, though very basic, can be applied to multiple watersheds, not solely the Nanjimoy and Matawarman Creek watersheds. <clears throat> As useful as GIS modeling of the landscape can be, results should always be viewed critically. There are some things that GIS will never be able to accurately capture. The human experience is too complex to reduce to a handful of variables, but what GIS can do and can do well is to mark and document places of importance. GIS is a tool that helps to analyze and display trends. It cannot always tell you why certain places are important but it can provide the kind of evidence that can be more easily connected to modern indigenous uses of the landscape. Incorporating the human experience with the landscape <clears throat> or finding meaning in the landscape can be informed through discussion with contemporary and often descendant native groups. Native communities can identify locations, sites, and places that are important to their communities in the past and in the present and also give a suggestion as to why they are important. <clears throat> Oral histories are a powerful tool for understanding the native landscape. Historical records, too, can also be useful and can supplement these oral histories. Finding references to native places within colonial records is fairly typical, at least in Maryland and Virginia. Tribal communities can then help to verify and interpret these records from their own perspective rather than through the lens of a colonizer. While this is a pretty busy map here, it's shown for representation only. <clears throat> and this is what we produced for the summary map of the Nanjumoy and Matawoman ICL. Uh, what it does suggest is that there that a synthesis of environmental, historical, social, and cultural var variables can reveal a rich, complex, indigenous cultural landscape that is greater than the sum of its parts. The information represented on this map can be used for interpretive educational, preservation, and conservation purposes by the Piscataway, as well as other stakeholders. <clears throat> Using what we learned from the Nanjimoy and Matawoman Creek ICL, we applied the model to the greater tidal Chesapeake landscape traversed by the Smith Trail. Selecting a few variables <clears throat> that included elevation, slope, proximity to marshes and proximity to substantial creek streams and riverways, also known as transportation tributaries in the ICL criteria, as well as archaeological data, we were able to identify areas elsewhere in the watershed as having a high probability for ICLs. We also noted the presence of contemporary tribal communities and also considered the rate of sea level rise in land development to develop a prioritized list for NPS and Chesapeake Conservancy to use for future mapping exercises. We recommend that if you have similarly large regional landscapes, begin first with an obvious landscape such as Nanjimoy or Matawarman landscape and use that model to develop priority areas for further mapping. And to close this off, I'm going to give it back to Julie. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, once the priority list for the Smith Trail was developed that Scott was just talking about, 
the Rappahannock River watershed emerged as a top priority. And uh, NPS and the Chesapeake Conservancy, um, they're moving forward with documenting the Rappahannock ICL. That project has just begun. Uh, St. Mary's College is working with Chief Ann Richardson um, and the Rappahannock Tribe of Virginia, some members that are pictured here, to undertake this effort. And like the Piscataway, the Rappahannock are very excited about the prospect. While well, everyone involved with mapping ICLs shares a goal of land conservation and interpretation for the Captain John Smith Trail, the Rappahannock are really excited because they see the ICL as both an educational tool, especially for their youth, um, and as a tool for cultural com uh, conservation. In this, uh, Scott and I have prepared the synopsis of the mapping process in this summary slide. And it is a summary, so you're, you know, uh, we recommend that you go back to the original sources. But we included in it what we found to be ideal for staffing and the process. We recommend that you use this list as a guide, at least to get started with your projects. And we also recommend that you consult our Nan Chamoy Matter Woman ICL report, um, the link we've shared with you, um, and any other reports, including those on NPS's Chesapeake Bay Office's um, Indigenous Cultural Landscape website. It's a plethora of useful information there. Um, good luck with your efforts. Our experience has been that this work can be very rewarding on so many levels. And I want to close by thanking the National Park Service, the Chesapeake Conservancy, our Native partners, and the many other stakeholders and participants who have supported our work. And if anyone participating today has questions or comments, Scott and I would be happy to answer them. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Julie, and so much, Scott, um, for that excellent presentation. Once again, our apologies for some of the technical difficulties, um, but we do have it recorded, so you'll be able to, to review the presentation again, and we'll also um, be able to share the, the PowerPoint presentation with everyone today, too. So at this point, let's go ahead and open it up to any questions um, that folks may have who have joined us as participants. Um, I did just place the link that was on that last mm -hmm. slide into the chat box, so you can go ahead and click on that if you're interested. Um, does anyone have a question to, to start us off with? Uh, hi. I just want to say kudos. Thank you for um, your presentation. And I feel like um, is this pretty much um, very innovative in the National Park Service? Because I, I see a lot of other National Park units that we maintain um, the perspective of the colonizers, and we really don't dive in and partner with um, other the indigenous peoples that were affected. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. Other questions or comments for the presenters? Yeah, hi. This is um, Barbara Butler Bonsgard, and I work in the planning program in the Pacific West region. And I just want to thank the presenters because I'm actually an alumni of, of St. Mary's College and worked for the Chesapeake Bay program a long time ago. And this is really exciting to see this work. But I also wanted to just check in and see if this concept of ICLs um, has been applied or if there's any plans to apply it. Um, in other areas of the, the national park system? That's a question that I can't answer, but maybe there's somebody in in the uh, room that can answer that. This is Suzanne Copping. I'm with the Chesapeake Office of the National Park Service, and it's a great question. And we get ans we get asked this question um, a lot of times when we make this presentation. Uh, I Anecdotally, I've been keeping a, a, a real loose tracking. Um, anecdotally, we have some evidence that the approach is being utilized in some of in some national parks um, as a way as really a lens through which to engage with indigenous communities and in talking about places that are important to them. Uh, so we've heard there's maybe some use out in the Olympic Peninsula, um, perhaps some use out at Mount Rushmore. We don't have a whole lot of specific um, details yet in, in the actual results of using the approach. Um, and, and just um, another thing we're hearing, um, that, that the concept is 
actually we're seeing that the concept is actually being um, referenced in Fish and Wildlife Service um, CCPs and has um, been an influence on NOAA's um, use of maritime cultural landscapes as an, a, a way to engage with indigenous communities. So um, we're, we're approaching that tipping point perhaps when there's some real solid outcomes, but we're certainly track, tracking um, what we're hearing. Great, thank you. Other questions? We have a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, one is asking about what the tribe plans to use the ICL information for. Um, I, I can, uh, I, I, in some ways I was thinking earlier today, I wish that I had made sure that there was a uh, Piscataway tribal member here with us, but um, not really feeling comfortable speaking with them, but being involved with some of the projects that are going on. I think that this work will be used for land conservation, um, education, interpretation, and it's being put to work right now in a separate independent project that's kind of paralleling what's happening with the ICL development. The um, Piscataway um, people have received state funding to develop a master plan for a Piscataway Indian Heritage Trail through Pers uh, Piscataway, I'm sorry, through Piscataway Eyes is what the title of the trail is. And so this ability to really drill down and look at that landscape has really helped to inform the, um, the, the trail development. Um, and then, you know, that, that's a project that's going on now and that we hope will go on for a while. We also hope that this document will continue to serve as a record and become an archive of what was viewed at this, at this time. Great. And then one other question from the chat box. How did the, and I'm going to butcher this name, but Zakaya Creek area fit into the project or the program? It is Sakaya. Okay. And, and and your question, I'm sorry. How does the that creek area fit into the project or the program? Okay, for Sakaya. Are you yes. asking about Sakaya? Um Sakaya Sakaya is actually a run, Sakaya run and it, it is the headwaters of the Wicomico River and it um empties in ultimately empties into the Potomac. It's a uh, 20 or 30 miles south of the Nanjimoy and Mattawoman landscape, I'm sorry, uh, creeks. Um, it is part of the Piscataway homeland. Um, this particular ICL study was already pretty big around Nanjimoy and uh, Mattawoman, so we focused there. And hopefully the Nanjimoy Mattawoman project will serve as a model for continuing this throughout the Piscataway homeland. But the Zakaya Run and the Wicomico River are very important to indigenous communities in Southern Maryland. And, and I hope I answered your question. Great, other questions from participants? Hi, um, I have a question. This is Brenda Williams. Um, I uh, am a landscape architect and I've done a lot of work with um, national park units, mostly in the Midwest, but some in the Northeast. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm wondering if, if you've had any um, promise of is, is use of this process and the engagement of tribes in, in not just identifying but sort of long-term management, is, is that helping in any way to lead towards improvement of policies for tribal members to collect materials within national parks. Again, I'll have to ask somebody from the National Park to answer that, National Park Service. Oh, this uh, is Suzanne. Can... Go ahead. That, that's okay, Suzanne. I'm sure you can answer this as well as I. Go ahead. Well, uh, perhaps so, perhaps not. I think that is an excellent question. I think that from the Chesapeake office, um, we're, we're, we haven't we haven't gone that far with the concept yet to be, um, you know, to be facing that question and whether these studies can inform um, extraction of resources from national parks. But that's really interesting, um, and and we'll have to watch for for what the applications might be. And hi, this is Deanna Beecham. I, I think it's important to note that for those of us in the Chesapeake Bay office, um, most of the descendant communities that we're working with 
are not federally recognized tribes and do not have lands or a considerable amount of lands that are in their possession or that they are active in managing. There's really within our watershed very, very few federally recognized tribes and the, the, the tribes that do own land might own maybe maximal a thousand acres. So it's it's not publicly um, public reservation land or even reservation land. So we're not dealing with that. I do believe that in the Olympic Peninsula that will be slightly different, but we have not heard any anecdotal evidence of that yet. Hey, this is uh, John Reynolds. Can if, am I on a speaker? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, um, what Deanna said is 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 right, and it's very important. Um, this this concept was developed in an area where there was recognition that there are many uh, descendants of indigenous communities. There are many, many, um, and, and, but it is not an environment like the National Park Service is used to working in in the West. As Deanna said, there are very few um, uh, federally recognized tribes and also not very many even state recognized tribes. And so the, the idea here was to figure out a way beyond the way the Park Service was normally uh, dealing with gaining information. Uh, that said, and the question about, back to the question about um, uh, using the concepts to inform uh, the gathering of materials in national parks. There's, I mean, there's no reason at all that this, that this mapping concept, uh, as presented, could not be used for that purpose. Now, whether or not it can be used to inform the creation of the policy, which is those of you who follow this stuff know, is uh, been going on for, let's see, in my experience, at least 25 years. Uh, maybe 35 years, and is fraught with all kinds of different views of what's appropriate in national parks and what's not. But uh, and so I don't know if the if the information will be used to inform the policy making. Um, but there's no reason at all why the the process or a, an evolution of the process couldn't be used to determine. Um, where and how and how much yeah in, in, you know in consultation with Indian peoples um, well thank you um, are there other questions or comments about that or There is another question on the chat function, Julie and Scott. Um, someone's asking about where can the map of the archaeological sensitivity be found if it's not a part of the report? The, um, the map that we generated is a part of the report, and if they download it, they'll find it there. But as, as um, many people know, I don't know if all people know, archaeological information, most states and organizations want to keep it confidential to protect any kind of looting or destruction or disturbance of um, archaeological sites. Um, but because the scale at which our maps were produced does not pose a, a real risk, for the Nanjimoy and Matterwoman area, you can find the general areas um, on, the, on the PDF on the um, Chesapeake Bay Office's uh, ICL website. And did that answer the question, do you think? Yeah, I think I think so. Okay. Yep. Any other outstanding questions? Uh, Suzanne, this is John again. I might just make one comment if I might. And that is um if people are looking, if people in the Park Service that are on this phone are looking to, to find a Park Service policy that they're supposed to use this, um, there's nothing like that that exists yet. Uh, but 
you know, that's no reason at all why people who are trying to figure out how to have better and more informed relationships with native peoples who are within their park area or the area in which they're working, be it a heritage area or anything else, um, can't, there's no reason at all that the concept just can't be taken and used. It's not proprietary. It doesn't belong to anybody. And I think one of our hopes out of these webinars and anything else that we do to to uh, spread the word about this is people will say, hey, you know, maybe I can adapt this, or maybe, if, if you can't use it exactly, maybe I can adapt this um, so that I can create uh, more meaningful relationships with the native people with whom I deal, or starting relationships that don't exist now. Um, so, you know, if you're if you're looking to say, wow, I'm supposed to do this because the Park Service says I am, we would hope that you not wait, that you um, spread the, spread the uh, idea around, share with people the information, talk about how it might apply in wherever you work, and, um, and engage in um, creating a new world about how indigenous peoples are dealt with, whether or not they have a reservation, or whether or not they're federally recognized. And by dealt with, I should say how they're included. Well, this is Julie King again, and I and I, and I thank you, Mr. Reynolds, for that those comments. And I want to note that while I can't, I I'm not uh, controlling the chat box. I can see uh, people who have uh, who are online, and one of the people that's online is named Proctor, and I don't know who that is. I do know it's a Piscataway name, and maybe Proctor would like to add something to. Um, the conversation or have a question or a comment, I'd love to hear what you have to, to say. Was that name Zelda Proctor? Hello. Zelda, did you have anything that you might want to add to or contribute to the discussion? You no, know, but I was very excited to find out about the webinar, and I adjusted my lunch schedule so I could uh, listen in. I did have a little difficulty um, logging in uh, initially, uh, but once all that was fixed and I was able to hear everything, and um, believe it or not, I'm watching this on my little cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm looking forward to seeing the webinar because uh, some of the information was muffled because of, yeah, you know, I guess my, uh, I have a Windows phone and the applications aren't as friendly. Well, I look forward to you being able to look at it. And I, I don't know that we've met, but I hope we get an opportunity to meet soon. Um, I believe I was, is this Dr. King? It is. Okay. I was sitting behind you at the, um, um, the initial orientation of the Piscataway Eyes. Oh, excellent. Well, yes. we'll definitely talk soon. Thank you for joining today. Thank you. Great. Uh, this is Jay Thoyer at Joshua National Park. If I can throw in one last question here before we finish up. Sure. Yep, go ahead, Jay. One last question. Um, I, had a, I had a question about the, um, the, the ICL criteria. You guys had a slide at the very beginning about those criteria you developed. My question is sort of how those relate to sort of the standard defined uh, cultural landscape characteristics we typically use for other cultural landscape uh, analyses, and if there was you know, any kind of direct correlation back and forth between them, and if during this process you saw the need to sort of develop new criteria that may have deviated from what we typically do for cultural landscapes. I can, uh, I'll, I'll just start the conversation by saying that um, these were criteria that were actually developed by NPS and then I think they were revised and then we worked with them and then we also added some revisions based on our experience with the Nanjimoy and Matawoman landscape. But again, I'm going to have to ask the, um, a representative from the National Park Service to talk about, you know, other aspects in the Park Services program for how the, these relate. Is, is someone there that could address that? Julia, I can take a stab at it. This is Deanna again. Um, and. Uh, as some of you may already know, I've been working with this concept since it first got written down. Um, 
the, the initial development of the criteria was done with a team of people that consisted of Park Service people, tribal people, uh, state and other agency people, and NGOs folks. And it was based on our archaeological criteria primarily. And it was not done from the perspective of making this fit with the concept of what National Park Service defines as a cultural landscape. It was done from an indigenous perspective and from an archaeological perspective in terms of finding those kinds of places, but not really trying to tie this. That is a step that has to happen as we go forward with this. And various people want to make changes and other people start to use it. As John said, this is an it's an open concept. It doesn't belong to anybody. Um, I might add to what Deanna just said, uh, um, and, and she's absolutely right. We started out with doing the comprehensive management plan for the John Smith Trail. And basing what we were trying to do on what the legislation said was important about the trail, and there were two two things, and they got mentioned um, in the in in, uh, in the in the present in the first, in the starting presentation. And those two things were what landscapes were evocative, visually evocative, um, and we tried to make visual as visceral as possible. Um, what landscapes were evocative of the time when John Smith um, encountered the native peoples and in, the Indian peoples in uh, the Chesapeake Bay Area? And the second one was um, the, the, uh, the, the mandate to um, educate and interpret to people the culture of those peoples who lived here. Well, you know, in the West, we would have gone to the, uh, the federally recognized tribes and we would have sat down and asked them. As Deanna said earlier, we didn't really have that luxury. We had a lot of people um, who most, most people, and particularly most uh, white people and most bureaucrats, did not even know existed. They, you know, the, the common thread in the East is there are no more Indian peoples. Um, and that's just not true. There's Indian, there's Indian communities, you know, virtually everywhere you look. And so the concept that Deanna came up with, the ICL, was one that was geared towards, not towards um, any uh, cultural landscape approach of the Park Service, uh, was already doing, but geared towards how do we how do we engage with those peoples and use modern day knowledge from archaeology and and making connections between what people said they would do as um, and and in the cultures that were extant at the time of John Smith. Well, what would they would do? Where would they hunt? Where would they live? What kinds of Places would they grow things on? Much of that can be inferred from where the archaeological sites are, but not necessarily all of it. And so, um, Dave mentioned the workshop when when the criteria were created. So they were not created in relationship to any other model that exists. Uh, they were created entirely to try to reflect what we could. Um, so what, we, what we could infer with some confidence uh, to meet the mandates of the John Smith Trail legislation and to be true to the indigenous peoples that still exist all through the landscape. And I would add to what John is saying is that as this research has been going on, that um, First, another another group from the University of Maryland, and then Julie's group from the St. Mary's College of Maryland. There, when you start working with these indigenous communities, 
they're going to tell you we're more interested in what we're going what's going on with us now than we are with what was going on with us 400 years ago because it is 400 years where we live and they will push your your view and want to push your view more and more to modern times and that's why when the criteria were expanded invariably they are expanded to include the areas that are important to them and that will be other sites that they know are historic to them, but also what's important to them now. That's it. Great. Julie, this is Stan Bond. Oh. Hey, Stan. Hey, Stan. I, I, I just had one thing I wanted to add that um, a little bit pertinent to this is that you know the gathering regs for the National Park Service I believe have been published the draft regs have been published in the uh, Federal Register and so in the very near future we will be able to have um, procedures where uh, indigenous groups can come and uh, and gather at least certain kinds of things from from Park Service lands and I think that's a, been a really important first step in, in how we're going to be able to reach out to groups all over the U.S. That's great. That's awesome news, Jan. Thank you. Great. I, I also want to agree with Deanna and John. I think that um, the Park Service's concepts of how we deal with cultural landscapes is is very different than how we deal with, with this type, in this type of a study, how we, how we deal with the landscape and um, you know, as an archaeologist, I've had lots of conversations with the uh, uh, cultural landscape program and um, uh, many spirited conversations, shall we say. And I, you know, as archaeologists, we just tend to take a different view. And um, the Park Service's landscape program, I think, tends to take a more of a static view of a landscape at a particular time. And I think we, as archaeologists, take a, a more of an evolutionary view of landscape over a longer period of time. I agree. I think that we tend to see landscapes as dynamic, but the thing that we archaeologists and and everybody sort of it, I think needs to work on is this relationship, you know, this arbitrary divide between natural and cultural. Um, but I think that's starting to, um, especially in the 21st century, I think that divide is starting to not totally crumble, but you know, people are definitely challenging it and people are thinking more critically about it. Um, but thank you for your comments, um, Stan. Are there any other questions or, or comments? Great. And Julie, this is Cass. I think um, just out of respect of everyone's time, because we're a bit over the uh -huh. presentation time that we set up, um, we can certainly send out the presentation to everyone following the close of the webinar. Um, I did plug in a link to where people can watch the webinar again, and we'll also post the presentation there. Um, certainly on behalf of the Scaling Up team, thank you to Julie and Scott and Suzanne and Deanna for, for putting this presentation together. There's obviously a lot of, obviously a lot of interest in this topic. Um, and so we're very, very grateful to, to have you be featured as a webinar um, with Scaling Up. And we'll look for other similar topics um, to, to dive into. With that said, um, please join us for our next Scaling Up webinar. We actually have one next week on the 18th at 3 o'clock Eastern, featuring the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's um, efforts with large landscape conservation. Uh, we'll also post that on that external site with the Practitioners Network, so you can find that login information there. With that said, thanks again to our presenters and to all of our participants. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye.